chapter 113, Psalms 113. If you're new to the Bible, just open up pretty much to the middle. You'll find Psalms. And there's a bunch of chapters in there. And look for 113. We're going to be preaching from the entire chapter of 113, but it's only nine verses. So you're all right. I'm going to give a kind of an extended introduction. We're just getting to know each other. So I have to um, introduce myself. I want to talk a little bit about the church plant. Then I want to say a few words about the psalm. And then we'll get to reading the psalm and then praying. And then we'll get into preaching. So first a little bit about myself. Um, uh, my name is Stephen. Uh, my wife is Abby. As Warren said, we have four kids right now. Um, three boys. Simeon, who's ten. Clay, who's seven. Josiah, who's four. I practiced that. And um, little baby Serenity, who's a foster child of ours, uh, moving towards adoption. Uh, she's now 11 months, soon to be a year, a couple weeks, so we're excited to have her. Um, I serve as one of the pastors of Great, Great City Church of the Northeast, which is in the far northeast section of Philadelphia. Um, and I also serve, I also work a full-time job at a book binding plant. Um, so I work in the office of a, 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 actually a factory that makes, like, manufactured Bibles. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so I'm excited. Uh, about three years ago, uh, Grace City Church of the Northeast, which is in the far northeast section of Philadelphia, um, sent uh, us out as a small group. You, you guys have small group ministries. We have small group ministries as well. We call them discipleship communities. And so we started a discipleship community group in the neighborhood of Frankfurt, which is where Abby and I live. And so what we did was we took people that lived in that neighborhood or around that neighborhood, and we started a small group that we said we were praying and hoping that one day this small group would grow into its own church and it'd be its own congregation out of, some, uh, of our church in the Northeast. So uh, we've been at it for about three years now, living in the neighborhood. Some people have moved into the neighborhood to be with us. Other of us have lived there for a while. Um, my wife and I have lived there for about seven years now. Um, so we've been, we've been there for about three years. And so the plan is, is that uh, starting in this spring, we're going to stop going up to Sunday services up in the Northeast, and we're going to start having our own Sunday services down in Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia. Um, so the plan is for in March, we'll start having a couple services, and then in April 1st this year is Easter Sunday, and that'll be our first big public launch where we invite the neighborhood to come and be a part of. So this, that's kind of the timeline of what's happening here over the next couple of months. So very exciting times for us. I'll be stopping my, my bookbinding job uh, at the end of this year and then be full-time at that point with just the church. Board. So that's very exciting to me. Um, we, as a um, Sovereign Grace church plant, have already been officially approved by Sovereign Grace. So by, by means of that, we are already in this together. So you may have just met me a few minutes ago, um, but we are already in this together. So I want to start by saying thank you for being a part of this family of churches, for being a part of this denomination, being part of this group of people that have already supported us and have already prayed for us and have already been a group of people that are for us and excited about church planting. Um, and you guys are a great model of church planting, having been a church plant yourself and then having sent out several church plants and even most recently our friends out in South Philly who um, we've come to know and love with uh, Jeff and his wife and th their church down there um, being in the same city as us. So it's been so exciting to... to to know you guys from afar and now be with you guys. And so I want to just start by saying thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, we look up to your church and we are just thrilled and so blessed to be here today. So thank you for allowing us to do this together. Um, I'm going to give um, some applications about church planting. And the reason I'm going to do that from this song is because we're planting a church together. Um, we, we do this together. And so you guys are very much a part of what's happening in Frankfurt. You may have never even heard of Frankfurt before. But you are a part of it um, by means of being a part of this family together. So thank you for that. Um, just a few words about Frankfurt. Um, Frankfurt is, uh, if you're not really familiar with the city, if you cross over the Betsy Ross Bridge, it kind of drops you off into Frankfurt. So that's where Frankfurt is. If you're familiar with the, um, the Market Frankfurt line, the, the, the L's, that's, that, the, that's the public transportation of, of Philadelphia. Frankfurt is the last stop in the Northeast. That's, what our, that's where our neighborhood is. Um, Frankfurt is known as not a nice neighborhood. Um, 
It's, uh, it's known right now for crime. Um, it's known for poverty. Um, it's known as a rough place. Most people avoid Frankfurt. Um, lots of people that, that aren't involved in the church say, why would you move into that neighborhood? Or you're not raising your kids in that neighborhood, are you? Uh, things like that <laughs> get said to us quite often. Um, a lot of people drive around Frankfurt so they don't have to go through Frankfurt. Um, and it's, it's a reality. And in fact, in the, in the three years that our small group has been there, um, and, and longer, as many of us have lived there longer than that, we've experienced these things firsthand. Um, so we've had some people in our small group um, get caught back into addictions that they were coming out of, and some people that have been um, incarcerated. And we've had some close family members um, get, um, get lost to street violence, and uh, um, lives were cut off too short. Um, people in our group, um, people that we know and love, we have neighbors that don't live on our block anymore. Um, and it's sad. It's been painful. It's been hard for our group already. Um, but it's interesting to see our group's resolve and to say, this is why we need to be here. Um, this is why we want to be in this neighborhood. And when the pain comes, it's like, this is why we need to be around this neighborhood. Our, our heart is to plant a church that ministers especially to people from hard situations. Um, our, our mission, we have a mission statement, it's, it's to glorify God by making and maturing disciples of Jesus in our neighborhood. We believe the gospel message, and we believe the gospel message transforms lives. Um, so that's what we want to see. That's what we want to be a part of. That's what we want to be doing is proclaiming the gospel to the people of Frankfurt so that their lives can be turned around and they can see God for who he is and their lives can be transformed by the power of the gospel, which brings us to the word of God. Psalm 113, a few more words of introduction. This psalm is called a descriptive praise psalm. Um, there's lots of different kinds of psalms in the book of Psalms. Um, this one is called a descriptive praise psalm because what it does is it describes why we should praise God. It's pretty good, right? It's a simple structure. There's nine verses. The first three verses give us a call to praise God. It calls people everywhere to praise God. And then the next six verses tell us why we should praise God. The next three verses talk about we should praise God because he's in the highest place. And then the last three verses talk about how God, who is, even though he's in the highest place, he cares for the poor. And he cares for the needy. That's who our God is. And because our God is the God who sits in the highest and cares for the lowest, he's worthy of all of our praise. So that's the main theme of this psalm and it's the main theme of this service. Um, is that God sits in the highest and he cares for the lowest and he is worthy of all of our praise. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take these three sections of this psalm and we're going to apply it to two different areas. We're going to apply it to church planting, which we are doing together, and we're going to apply it to our own individual lives as well. So we're going to look at these three sections, and we're going to break it down. How does this, what does this mean for our church plant? What does this mean for uh, our own lives? So let's read the psalm now, and then we'll pray, and we'll get to it. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, would you teach us now from your word? God, I pray specifically that you would help us to see that you are worthy to be praised and you would show us that you are the great God who sits in the highest place and we can trust you because you're king over everything. 
I pray particularly for people that are here today that are struggling with trust, that are going through hard times and need to be reminded by your Holy Spirit through your Holy Word that you are a God who is trustworthy. I pray specifically for people that are going through hard times themselves, feeling needy, feeling poor, feeling isolated, feeling lonely. God, would they sense your presence in a very real way this morning? Would they hear from your word that you are a God who cares deeply? I pray for all of us that as we hear about your great care, that we would be a people that are moved with compassion towards other people. And that you would change our hearts so that we are not um, cold towards people, but we are moved towards people that are hurting and, and struggling and going through difficult times. That you would, you would work in us a heart for people that are struggling. God, these are things that do not happen naturally. We need you to show yourself as the great God who sits over all things and the great God who cares for the lowest of things. God, would you fill us? Would you teach us? Would you guide us? Would you direct us? Would you convict us? Would you change us? So that at the end of the sermon, we are different people because of your word and the work of your spirit in our hearts, God. Only you can do this, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just one more note of, of introduction to this psalm. This psalm is actually a psalm that is a um, that was sung during the Passover celebration. Um, so this psalm, along with uh, Psalm 114, 15, 16, 17, and 18, were the psalms that were sung during the Passover. And if you remember, the Passover was the time that the Israelites celebrated coming out of Egypt. Um, and they, the, the, the Moses, and you remember the Ten, the ten Commandments and the, the, the plagues, and then uh, the final plague with the Passover, and God re- redeemed his people out of, out, of, out of Egypt and brought them into the land. And so God set up this Passover celebration that they were going to have, where they were always going to um, remember when they were brought out of Egypt. And if you remember when uh, Jesus was celebrating the Passover at the Last Supper, they went out and they sung hymns. Remember at the end they sung hymns? Well, these would be some of the hymns that they were singing. That was part of the Passover meal was they would sing these psalms. And the psalms they would sing was Psalm 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. 119 is way too long, so they didn't sing that one. That's the longest one to say. Um, so I, I want to just draw your attention to a few things. With that in the back of your mind, is kind of the historical context of what's happening here and, and when the Israelites would sing and when they, when they would, would remember this psalm. Uh, let's, let's look at the first, first three verses. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. One thing I want to highlight from these three verses is you notice that the word Lord is used five times in just those three little verses. And the phrase name of the Lord is used three times in just these three verses. The person who's writing this is drawing our attention to Lord. And you notice that Lord is written capital L-O-R-D in your English Bible. And what that is telling us is that in Hebrew, it's the word Yahweh. And Yahweh comes from the phrase, I am who I am, which Moses first heard from God at the burning bush. Remember that story when Moses is at the burning bush and God, Moses says to, to the burning bush, to God at the burning bush, says, who should I say, who should, who should I say to, told me to go and, and, and tell this to Pharaoh? And he says, tell them, I am who I am has sent you. And the I am who I am is where we get the word in Hebrew where they translate it into Yahweh and that word is what we use in the English Bible with capital L-O-R-D. So as you're reading this, you're reminded, first, because it's Passover and you're singing at Passover. And second, because Lord, 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 name of the Lord, name of the Lord, name of the Lord is used over and over in these first three verses. Your mind goes back to the burning bush right away. And you're reminded of God, who is the self-existing one, the I am who I am. He doesn't need anything. That's why he appeared as a bush that was burning, but the bush wasn't burning up. The fire didn't need the bush to burn, right? 
So God is appearing, showing a picture. He's saying, this is like who I am. Like if this fire doesn't need this bush to burn, I don't need anything to exist. I am all by myself. I am God all by myself. I am the Lord. I am self-existent. I am independent from everything else. There's nothing else in all of the universe that is like that. Everything else depends on something else. But God is independent. He is alone and sovereign. And he is Lord. He is who he is, and he doesn't need anything. He's completely self-existent and self-determined and independent. But he doesn't just say, I am who I am at the burning bush, does he? He says, I've heard people's cry. He doesn't just flex his muscles, but he says, I've been listening, and I've been hearing my people that are in need. My people that are afflicted, my people that are in pain, and I'm going to go and I'm going to rescue them. Right? There's this neat juxtaposition in, in one of the verses where it says, Moses covers his eyes because he can't see the holiness of God. And in the very next verse, God says, I've seen my people. So it's like, you, you can't even look at me, but I've been looking at you closely, watching you, feeling what's been going on in my people's lives. And so right away, even, even before we get into the, the, the meat of the psalm, we're, we're reminded already that God is self-existent. He's the almighty one. He's, he's over all things. He doesn't need anything to exist. And he's the one that cares so deeply for his people, that loves the people that are in need, that, that feels the pain of his people. And he moves towards their affliction and their pain. And so even before we get into chapter, the, the rest of the psalm, we're already thinking, God, he's worthy to be praised because he's in the highest. He's over all things. He's independent. And he cares for the lowest, like the Israelite in slavery or the addict on the street. That's our God. He's worthy to be praised in all times and in all places. That's why in the next couple of verses it says, from the rising of the sun to a place where it's set from this time forth and forevermore, the name of the Lord is praised. Which is another way of saying he's worthy to be praised everywhere, all the time. Right? He's worthy to be praised everywhere, all the time. Why? Because he's the God that sits in the highest and cares for the lowest. You want to know why God deserves to be praised? You want a description of why he should be praised? Because he sits in the highest. And he cares for those. We believe that God deserves to be worshipped everywhere. Yes. That's why we plant churches. We plant churches so that people would worship God. People would know about God. Um, John Piper famously said, missions exist because worship doesn't. Right? Missions exist because worship doesn't. That's John Piper. We plant churches because we are convinced that church planting exists because worship doesn't. Our goal, our main desire is that people would worship God in Frankfurt. We want God to be praised. We, we don't just want people to put down and not pick up again. We don't want to just have people get good jobs. We don't just want people to get better schools to send their kids to. We don't just want people to be able to find better housing, cleaner streets. We do want those things, but ultimately what we really want is for God to be praised in Frankfurt, for people to worship our great God and Savior. But listen, it's not just church planting that exists because worship doesn't, or missions that exist because worship doesn't. It's we exist because worship doesn't. Look at verse 1. It says, praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the Lord. It doesn't say, praise, O professional people in ministry. Praise the Lord. It says, all the servants of the Lord are called on to praise the Lord, to bring glory to his name, to let people know that he is the God who's worthy to be praised because he sits in the highest. He's high above all things and he cares for the deep, the lowest and the hurting and the afflicted like all of us. So one of the applications for our own lives is that we exist because worship doesn't. We want to see people in our families, people at our jobs, people in our neighborhoods, people in our groups to praise God. Are you a student? Home on break? Be a student to bring praise to God. Are you a mom or dad? Be a parent bring praise to God? Are you 
in charge at work, the boss. Then be a boss to bring praise to God. Are you the, the low man on the totem pole like I am at work? Then be the low man on the totem pole doing all the actual work to bring praise to God. <laughs> Do you work in a cube? Do you work on a line? Do you work on a site? Do you do all those things to bring praise to God so people will know who this God is? Are you a neighbor? Are you a roommate? Are you a spouse? Do these things so that other people will praise God. They'll see how you live. They see how you talk. They see what your life is like. And they say, something that has affected that person. Something outside has come. I want to praise that God. I want to know that God. I want to give my life to that God. Through your words, through your life, through how you live. So we see already in the first three verses, um, God's worthy to be praised because he's seated in the highest and cares for the lowest. And he's worthy to be praised everywhere. And then it talks about, in the next couple of verses, it goes into the more deeper, like what it means to be praising God who's in the highest in 4 to 6, and then who cares for the lowest in 7 to 9. So let's look at 4 to 6 now. God who praise who praise God who sits in the highest. Verses four to six say this: The Lord is high above all nations, and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? A couple things I just want to highlight from these couple of verses is notice that it says that God sits. In the high place. Um, when the Bible talks about God sitting there, it's talking about his throne. It's talking about where he belongs. He sits in the highest place because that's where he belongs. If you were to go down to Washington, D.C. and go and take a tour of the White House and walk around, you could go and you could see the Oval Office and you could see where the president sits behind his desk. And you could see where the president belongs. But you couldn't go yourself and sit there and kick up your feet and open up your laptop and start doing work. Because you don't belong in that spot. That's where the president belongs. Or, to use an illustration that's a little more close to my heart, if you were to go to Lincoln Financial Field and take a tour of the facility there, and you were going to the Eagles locker room, right? And you would see Carson Wentz's locker off to the side, and there'd be light coming from it. <laughs> Walk up to it. You couldn't just sit down in front of that locker and take off your shoes and put on his cleats and put on his shoulder pads and act like you belong. That's not your spot. That's Carson Wentz's spot. That's where he belongs. And we thank God for that. <laughs> it's good preaching, right? I knew I was at home when I, when I came in and I saw someone in the Eagles jersey. When I, when I came in, you know, usually it's like this friendly faces and the smiles and stuff like that it makes you feel welcome and stuff. I saw Carson Wentz here, and I was like, yes, my people. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> Carson Wentz belongs in that spot. God belongs in the highest place, sitting above every nation, above all the earth, and above heaven, that's where God belongs. Notice how it says that he looks far down on the heavens and the earth, which implies there is no close second place to God. He's high and exalted and above everything. He's over all. As verse 5 implies, who's like the Lord our God? The answer, no one. No one can sit up that high. No one can climb into that throne and, and rule over all the earth like God does. He's God all by himself. He is almighty and all powerful and sovereign. He rules over all things. He sits on his throne over all the earth. Now in church planting, we take great comfort in this. As we go together to plant a church in the neighborhood of Frankfurt, we take great comfort knowing that this is God's work. This is God's thing. So sure, we're going to pray hard, and we're going to work hard, and we're going to preach hard, and we're going to have outreaches, and we're going to try to get to know people as best we can, and we're going to work as hard as we can, but ultimately, it's God's work. He's the one over all of this, you know? He's the one doing all this, and, and the nice thing about that is that 
um, it just takes so much pressure off. Right. You know, there's so much peace that comes from knowing that God is in control. That God is sovereign over all of our ministry. God is sovereign over everything. And it reminds us over and over again who gets the glory. God gets the glory. Any positive fruit that comes from it, any any joy that comes, any growth that comes, any making or maturing disciples that happens, it's God doing it. It's God. It's not me. It's not our team. It's not our great strategy. It's God. It's God's work. But he's not just king over church plants, right? He's king over all of our lives. King over everything that happens in our lives. I, you know, I was praying through this and praying for you guys, and you know, I pray that this section will give you peace. That reminded that God's in control. God's the ruler over everything. You know, I don't, I don't know what kind of life circumstances you're going through, what kind of life-altering things are about to happen, what, what, what kind of 2017 has been for you, and what 2018 is going to be for you. We need to remember God's in control. God is sovereign over all things. And let that be a, a peace to you. Let that be a comfort to you. Trust that God is ultimately in control. He's good. He's working for his ultimate glory and for our ultimate good. I encourage you to trust his powerful leadership for tomorrow, even if today it feels like chaos or evil reigns. There is a God seated on high, and he is worthy of our praise, and he's worthy of our trust. He rules over all things. He sits in the highest place. So, so far we've seen that God is worthy to be praised in all times and in all places because he's seated in the highest. Both in the Frankfurt Church plant and in all of our lives, we exist to worship God and to trust in his sovereign rule. This last section is my favorite. Mainly, my favorite part is the juxtaposition between 4 to 6 and 7 to 9. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in verse 4 so we get a running start into verse 7. Um, and you see this abrupt change that happens in the psalm. So we'll go from verse 4 and we'll read through to the end. The Lord is high above the nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down, on the heavens and earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. So, you catch that? You know, we go from the highest of heavens, above all nations, that God rules sovereignly over all things. And in the very next verse, we're in the ash heap of a poor man. We're talking about the needy who has nothing. Doesn't even have a home. He lives in the ash heap. And then goes on to talk about a nameless woman who wants to have kids. That's kind of the point, isn't it? God is our God that is high and exalted and, and worth yelling about and, and he's powerful and above all things and exists all by himself. And he's the God that cares for the lowest and the hurting and the minutia of our daily lives and the desires of our hearts and the people that everyone else has forgotten about. God cares deeply for those people. That's our God. He's both the high God over all things, and the God that cares deeply for the lowest. That's why I love this psalm. Because it points us to both those truths together. God is high above all things, sovereignly ruling all nations, and he cares tenderly for the poorest and needy among us. He is self-existent and self-determining, and he's independent, and he's free, and he's transcendent, and he's self-giving and loving and merciful. He's sovereign and all-powerful and all-knowing. And he's involved in the daily minutia of our lives. That's our God. He's worthy to be praised. One of the other things I really appreciate about this, these last three verses, is 
the highlight that, of God's great care. You know, it's not just like God just has a, a heart. Like I feel bad for those poor people out there. But it talks about God's care, his action towards the poor and poor than he. It talks about how he raises up the poor and, and seats them with princes. And it talks about with, with the, the barren woman. It doesn't just say that he gives her a kid. It says that he makes her a joyous mother of children. That's the kind of God we have. The, the kind of God that doesn't just give us a little bit. We're just, I feel kind of bad, so here's, some, here's a little something. You know? And then let me get on to my other important things. Right? He's the God that cares intimately and actively in our lives. Raises us up. Cares for us. Abundantly blesses us like he did with the barren woman. He goes well beyond well wishes. I feel so bad to action and care for his people. In, um, in Philadelphia and um, in all neighborhoods everywhere, in, people, in communities everywhere, there's poor and needy people in all places. But for different reasons, there's different areas that are high concentration of people that are, could be characterized by the description in these last couple of verses. Needy, poor, isolated, outcast, lonely. In the city of Philadelphia, where we're from, um, there's certain sections of the city that have a higher concentration of poverty, a higher concentration of difficulty, um, namely in North Philly and West Philly. Um, this psalm tells us how God feels and acts towards those neighborhoods. I, I believe that as a church, as a whole, like the church as a whole, like Christianity, should care about what God cares about. Right? And so that applies to a lot of things, but one of the things that that applies to is God's care in his heart for the poor. His care in his heart for the needy. Um, it's... It's frustrating and angering, even to me. Um, in, our, in our poorest neighborhoods, it's the lowest concentration of Bible-believing, gospel-teaching churches. Right? So in our neighborhood, we have a huge Jehovah's Witness campus. And we have two Islamic community centers. And we have a Mormon church. And we have lots of name-and-claim-it kind of churches. Believe God and get rich taking advantage of people. Uh, liberal, social gospel churches type places. And a couple evangelical churches. I think that the church as a whole should be upset by that. That the people that are hurting the most should have access to Bible teaching, discipleship, loving communities, believers, that can experience the gifts of a family, a church, a redeemed. That's why we're planning a church. We're planning a church in Frankfurt because we want to proclaim the gospel to the kinds of people mentioned in this psalm. We want, them, we want to invite them into the care of a local church where through the power of the Holy Spirit working through God's people, they can be raised from the dust and lifted from the ash heap. We want to care for the addicts and the single moms and the unemployable and the broken in our neighborhood by pointing them to the only one that can truly raise them up, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So will you help us to do that? There's a number of ways that you can be a part of this in addition to the ways you already are. Um, take an offering in a couple of minutes. You can give. Like I said, the, the, our original small group was people that mostly lived in the neighborhood or around the neighborhood already. Um, so we didn't necessarily pick out people. We picked out people mainly based on geography, not based on um, financial stability. <laughs> um, so we need help. <laughs> um, we, um, we'll be, we're a small group of about 20 people, so there might be opportunity for 
volunteering and coming to help and serve in different ways. Um, if you're interested in getting um, a newsletter, a prayer newsletter, um, then you can sign up for that. Uh, I have a couple sign-up sheets up here and also at the welcome table. Um, if you'd like to sign up to get a, a newsletter um, so you can hear about what's happening, maybe some opportunities to volunteer. And most importantly, to pray, right? Most importantly, to pray. Um, we don't really know how that works. We pray and God works, lives are changed. Um, we can't explain that fully to you, but we believe it works. You know? So would you pray? Would you pray for us? And your prayers will make a real difference in the neighborhood of Frankfurt. Um, so I ask you to do that. Um, to see the poor raised from the dust, the dust and the needy from the ash heap, and to see barren women to be in joyous homes with children. Pray that that would happen in our neighborhood. But it's not like there's only needy people in Frankfurt, right? Like all of us have people in our families, people in our communities, people that we come across. Maybe even at Thanksgiving, you sat around a table with somebody, you were reminded of the struggles and the hurt and the pain of isolation of some people in your own family. So one of my prayers for this psalm is that, that as you, you hear these, you would be reminded of God's heart towards those people. And it would compel you to want to move towards them. And to reach out to them. And to pray for them. And to care for them. Even though it's hard. And so as you see how God acts towards the needy, you would, your heart would be compelled and motivated to act in a similar way, raising people up and setting them in families and encouraging people. Um, people need friends, and they need to be pointed to the all-sufficient, all-powerful, high and exalted one who sits in the highest and who cares for the lowest. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about this God who rescues his people, who is self-existent and all-powerful and is high above all things, sovereignly ruling everything and caring for them deeply. Yes. That's what they need to hear. That's what they need to know. That's what they need to see in your lives. So I hope that you've seen how this psalm applies to the church plant we're doing, as well as your life. God is worthy to be praised for all time and in every place. That's why we're planting in Frankfurt, and that's why you exist. He sits above the heavens and the earth, sovereignly ruling over all. So we trust, we trust him as we plant churches, and we trust him in all of our lives. And God's heart and care for the needy compels us to plant churches in needy areas and to care for the needy in our own lives. <laughs> now, just one more thing to say. The psalm is applicable to our lives and is applicable to planning for Frankfurt. But ultimately, the psalm points us to Jesus. Jesus, the one who's seated on high, <coughs> ruling over all things, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, seated in the highest place, who came down and lived among the poor and the needy and the hurting and saw us in our spiritual isolation, and saw us in our spiritual ash heaps, and saw us in our spiritual neediness, and came down as one of us, and walked among us, and lived in our place, perfectly living the life that we could not live. And then dying in our place, dying of death. He didn't deserve to die, but we deserved to die because of the consequences for our sin. And then rising again, conquering that sin, and conquering death, and conquering hell forever, and giving us, everyone who would believe in him, new life here on earth, and the hope of eternal life forever. That's our God. He is the one who is seated on high and cares for the lowest. We see that most clearly in Jesus. 
came down from on high and took care of our deepest, most needy problem, our sin. God is worthy of all of our praise because he's seated in the highest and cares for the lowest, like you and like me. Let's pray. God, we pray again that you would move in our hearts. Teach us. Remind us. Show us, maybe for the first time, how great of a Savior you are. How good of a God you are. How powerful you are. How highly exalted you are. How you rule over all things sovereignly. How you look far down the heavens and the earth, and you come down and live among us. Remind us of your care for us, your love for us, the poor and needy, the people that were lost and now we've been found, the people that were broken and now we've been healed because of what you've done. God, would we praise you today? Would we worship you today? Would our hearts be filled with faith? Would our hearts be filled with gratitude? Would our hearts be filled with uh, motivation to care for others? Because of how you loved us, let us now love other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.